video is learning targets four through six, sponges, cnidarians, and flatworms, everyone's favorite things. Sponges are the simplest of all animals, meaning this, they share only the most basic characteristics with other animals. Remember those basic things, multicellular, eukaryotic, heterotrophic, cells that lack cell walls. These are the most basic characteristics of animals and sponges share only those things with other animals. Very, very simple organisms. They are aquatic and they require water to carry out many of their basic functions. So here's kind of how this works. There are these specialized cells in sponges. Wouldn't really call them tissues per se. So they don't really have a tissue structure, say like uh, you know, like we do, or like even jellyfish, they kind of have a simple tissues. These sponges just have these specialized cells, and what they do is they pump water throughout their bodies. Now, how does that work? Well, they basically bring in water from the outside. You can kind of see it here. Water coming from the outside being pumped into the sponge from the outside and out the top of the sponge. And so this creates this circulation that's going throughout the sponge, the entire organism. And this allows them to carry out many of their functions. This is how they feed, for instance. They take in these microscopic particles, these microscopic organisms from the water, and they just eat them as they take them in. Um, they bring in oxygen as well. So this would also be part, take care of their respiration. They bring in oxygen through the water. Uh, circulation, as far as how do they do circulation? Well, they can't do circulation or this whole system is a circulatory system, a circulation in that they're bringing in water from the outside, pumping it through the top, and so this whole system is circulation. Excretion, the wastes uh, diffuse to the outside of the cell and they're just pumped out through the top. So all of this requires this water system in order to take place. Respiration, feeding, circulation, excretion, all of this takes place because of water. Now as far as response, sponges do not respond to their environments in a typical fashion, but they have evolved toxins which basically make them inedible. And so in that case, um, you know, through natural selection they have evolved a response to the environment in that nothing's going to eat them. And so they don't have any natural predators as uh, as it were, because of this evolution of these toxins, but they're not responding. They can't move away from prey or or react or anything like that in, in that manner. Reproduction. Sponges sexually and uh, asexually reproduce. Here's a picture of the uh, sexual reproduction. And you can see the sperm swims in to the sponge, finds the egg, and that fertilizes, becomes a larva. And the, what is a larva? Well, a larva is just basically a immature organism. And this larva is actually modal, meaning they can swim around to their to their destination. This zygote grows into this larva, it swims around, eventually settles on the seafloor somewhere and grows. And for asexual, budding, uh, which is this um, basically like a little piece of the sponge, so kind of draw it like imagine a little piece kind of growing off of the sponge and eventually kind of breaking off and kind of growing into its own little organism there on the ground or pieces of the sponge can like literally break off and kind of float 
over here and grow into the ground. And so this is asexual reproduction. This is where they just make an exact clone of the of the parent. So again, not no, no diversity, but still this allows them to survive in, in tougher conditions. Now adult sponges are sessile, which means non-modal or just they stay in one place. Sessile. So there's another uh, important vocab word concerning these uh, early invertebrates. Now how do sponges contribute to their ecosystem? Well first of all what is this word ecology? Ecology is a study of ecosystems and study of how animals interact with each other, how animals interact with the environment and uh, factors like temperature and water control and water movement and all these different things going on in an ecosystem. And how do sponges contribute to that? Well, primarily, sponges provide habitat for other types of sea creatures. They provide habitat for other types of sea creatures. Some photosynthetic organisms enter into mutualistic relationships with the sponges. What is that? Mutualistic means that both the sponge and this little organism benefit, wherein the sponge receives the benefit of food and oxygen, because remember photosynth photosynthesis releases oxygen, so the sponge receives that oxygen, and the little organism gets protection because it now has a new place to live inside of a sponge. And so that's it on sponges. Sponges very simple types of organisms. Next is cnidarians. That's how you pronounce it, cnidarians. The C is silent. I don't know why it's there. These are soft-bodied, aquatic, carnivorous animals, and they use stinging tentacles to capture their prey. Some examples of these are jellyfish, there in the upper left, or upper right, uh, hydras, bottom right, and sea anemones, there on the left, and then corals which are not pictured here, but we will picture, or we will show a picture of corals in a moment. Corals. Now, jellyfish, or all cnidarians, have, are the simplest of all animals to have body symmetry and specialized tissue. They have a radial symmetry, as far as their body, their body plan, or most of them do. And they also have these specialized tissues uh, which cause the stinging. If you've been stung by a jellyfish, you know what that's like. It's not pleasant. Well, they have cells called nidocytes. And these nidocytes produce a structure called a nematocyst. This is spelled incorrectly. There should be an O here. Perhaps one year I will fix that. Uh, these nidocytes, specialized cells, remember anytime you see the word site, it's a cell, and they produce these nematocysts. Well, from the nematocyst, you get this stinging dart. And, you know, just like a mousetrap, as if you touch a mousetrap, the, the spring goes and breaks your finger. Um, well, this little spring is here, and anytime something rubs up against it, it causes this barb to unleash. And if you're a human, the barb just hurts you and maybe causes you to get tingly or whatever. But if you're like a little water flea or a little plankton or something, this barb completely paralyzes you. And then the jellyfish can, or the hydra or whatever it is, can now consume you. Here's an up close and personal uh, electromagnetic picture of this uh, barb. It looks like a dangerous thing. I'm glad they're really small. Now, as far as um, cnidarian body types, there are two, polyps and medusas. The polyps are sessile, a word we've mentioned before, meaning non-modal, whereas the medusa, or these, these bell-like structures, which you normally think of when you think of, them, of a uh, jellyfish or something like that, they are modal. And so you have both motile and sessile forms. You can have the same type of animal be either sessile or motile depending on the stage of life that it's in, depending on the environment. And so how do they feed? Well, we mentioned that kind of. They don't see their prey, so they don't move towards their prey and attack it in that sense. They just kind of float. 
and um, the prey will brush up against their tentacles that cause them to be um, paralyzed like this poor unsuspecting water flea here. And then the Nidarian will actually um, consume the organism by putting it into a cavity called the gastrovascular cavity. And this is essentially like a stomach. Don't think stomach in that it's a special organ because it's not an organ, it's just kind of a place. But it still serves that same purpose in that it helps to digest the food, get the nutrients out of the food so that the jellyfish or whatever can live. Now, respiration, circulation, and excretion are all similar in Nidarians in that they take place via diffusion throughout the body's cells. And so these animals are small uh, and they are generally unspecialized and so it doesn't take a lot to move materials in and out of the body and so this is done with the fusion and considering they are aquatic this is an easier thing to do if they as opposed to them being land animals now they do have before we talk about movement they do have sensory organs that detect gravity and light so they react to their environment by changing direction based on stimulus or by stinging prey based on touch. And so they can move towards the light or they can move towards the top of the water as opposed to like the sand in the bottom in order to find prey. But they're not looking around for prey. They're just going to where it most likely is, is the top and near the light. And so, and then they respond to kill the little organisms and eat them but they don't, again, they don't like flash out a tentacle and sting them. So when you get stung by a jellyfish, it's because you uh, got stung by it. It didn't like sting you on purpose as some malicious animal or something like that. Now movements, how do they move? They're able to move. The Medusa part of a Nidarian is able to move by propelling itself, kind of bringing in water into its body and then pushing that water out in kind of this wave motion which allows them to move but then some Nidarians the polyp stages are sessile and so they do not move. Now here's their reproductive cycle uh, don't go crazy and start drawing all this there's not a whole lot here I want you to know other than that they can reproduce asexually and sexually. The asexual reproduction is through budding and here you see on the um, left well, Apparently I just saved this. Uh, here on the left you have this uh, polyp or this polyp stage looks like a plant but it's not because you have all these different budding that's going on. So you have these different organisms that are being budding off here, a feeding polyp and um, develop of new polyps here on the bottom and then the medusas can actually come off of this polyp and kind of swim away. And there's also sexual reproduction whereas a male and female uh, jellyfish can produce sperm or egg and they have what's called external fertilization in that they release their gametes directly into the water they combine together form a zygote and you literally have like little eggs kind of floating in the water uh, if you're in if you've ever been in the ocean that's full of jellyfish eggs it kind of resembles ice except for it's decidedly not ice it is not. It's jellyfish eggs. So how do they contribute to their environment? Well, the main thing that we're going to discuss here is what we left off earlier were the corals. Now the corals form these polyp stages and they basically kind of hoard together and as they die they harden and they form these giant structures called coral reefs. And coral reefs are basically like the rainforest of the sea because there's such a, a richness and diversity of different kinds of species. They use the reef for habitat and therefore you're going to have predators that come in and use it for hunting grounds. And you have all kinds of plants that live here. And so you have this different, lots of diversity near the coral reefs which allow the Nidarians to contribute greatly to uh, that particular ecosystem. Now coral reefs are struggling because of man-made uh, systems and man interruption of the corals and also things like 
global warming as well are destroying the corals worldwide. So that brings us to flatworms. Flatworms are soft, flattened worms with tissues and internal organs. They actually have three tissue layers, which we'll get to briefly. They have bilateral symmetry, which is kind of a new thing, and cephalization, so the formation of a head. Flatworms are called acelomates. And we mentioned a coelom in the last video. A coelom is just a body cavity. Man. The spelling struggle. Body cavity. Now, an acelomate, remember anytime you put the A at the beginning of something, it cancels it out. So these are organisms that do not have the coelom. But they do have three tissue types. And so let's zoom in to, to examine the tissue types here. There's the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. Now the endoderm, endo means inside. So this is the inside most layer. The endoderm is what's going to make up the digestive tract, whether it's a flatworm or a elephant. The endoderm forms the digestive tract. The mesoderm is where you're going to find um, muscle tissue, bone tissue. You won't find bones in these, these worms. But as we continue to talk, we're going to find these kinds of structures. Uh, but these worms do have rudimentary muscle cells. And so this is the uh, mesoderm. And then the outer, and meso means middle, that's helpful. And the outer covering is the ectoderm. This is like the skin, the body covering. And so there you have the three tissue layers, and those three tissue layers are going to stick with us as we talk about the rest of the animals. Now, how do they feed? Well, they feed by what's called an external pharynx. External, easy word to spell. Pharynx, not so much. Kind of a weird looking word. And a pharynx is just a, basically the, the beginning of your mouth, kind of where you're in your body. It's where your nose and your mouth meet together in the back of your skull or in your skull. Um, for these organisms, it's not even part of their head. It's just kind of part of their chest, and it's this tube that sticks out, and it kind of vacuums up whatever food there may be. Now, they, are, they can be carnivores. They can be parasites, and they can also be what's called a... Detritivore, which is an organism that eats dead material. And so they vacuum up this food into their gut and it gets digested. Now, what kind of response do they have? Well, first of all, let's talk about respiration, cellular, uh, circulation, excretion. All of these happen again through diffusion, very small organisms. And so these things happen through diffusion, circulation respiration and excretion, all their diffusion. Now response, the head of the flatworm, and I use the word head loosely because this isn't like a head like you would think of like the head of a, a deer or a person or something like that. It's just kind of a place where uh, the sensory organs kind of develop. And then you see some eyes there. But these aren't eyes like you and I have. We, they don't have a pupil and that sort of thing. They're just kind of eye spots, which is why they're named that. And there's a ganglia. Now a ganglia is a special term meaning just a bundle of nerves so we kind of have the beginnings of what is like a primitive brain but not a brain it's just where they receive the sensory or, uh, information and somehow decide what to do with it whereas this flatworm might see that there's light and want to move closer to the light and can actually do that so it's a a, a new evolutionary development where they're able to move towards something but they're still just seeing light. They're not seeing like their prey swim by or, or whatever. They're still just kind of barely able to sense what's going on. Now, before we talk about reproduction, actually, I want to finish talking about with movement. Now, move, for movement, they move through cilia, which you're familiar with cilia from previous units. Cilia are just hair-like projections, so they can move through that. But they also have primitive muscle cells, which contract to move the body, and so they can swim through their aquatic environments. And for reproduction, most flatworms are 
hermaphroditic, which means that they have both male and female sex organs. Now, that does not mean that they can reproduce with themselves. That means that they can reproduce with any other flatworm, however. So the finding of a mate is a trivial thing with flatworms. They just find another flatworm and they can reproduce. Um, but they can also reproduce asexually. And one of the ways that they do this is something called fragmentation. And you can kind of see what's going on in this picture. If you cut the worm up, it will grow into little worms. So you can cut its head off and the head will grow a new body and the body will grow a new head. And so it's not a head in the sense that if you cut the head off, it kills it, you know, like a werewolf or vampire or, some, or anything else for that matter. But it's, you know, it's, the head's not a structure like we would think of a head normally because you can just regrow a new one, the, or at least the flatworms can. And so this is how they reproduce asexually. A couple of groups of flatworms go through these quickly. There's three groups. Uh, turbularians, and these are free living flatworms. These are like uh, normally found in marine environments, also found in like ponds and that sort of thing. Free living flatworms. They just live on their own. Versus flukes. Now, flukes are not free living in that they are parasitic flatworms. They infect the internal organisms of their host. Uh, the liver fluke is seen here. The, the liver fluke gets into snails and the snails, uh, they, they reproduce inside the snail and the, the lamb or whatever it is eats the grass and then it lives inside the lamb. The lamb, uh, as this photo or this drawing so greatly illustrates, use the bathroom and then the little larvae get back into the snail, so it completes the whole life cycle of the fluke. Don't need to know that life cycle, but it is interesting. These things are parasitic, the meaning they live off another organism. This is flukes. And then lastly, tapeworms is a kind of flatworm. These are parasitic flatworms, and they infect the digestive tracts of their host. They literally uh, attach to the host using these um, hooks here, and they just kind of eat the food as it's going through. And you've probably heard of tapeworms before because uh, these can actually affect human beings.